I want to bestow upon people what I know. Hey there, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 402. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Mr. Brent Philpott. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on this show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and martial arts is my life. It is something I am so passionate about, I turned it into a job. And that's what we do here at Whistlekick. We produce things for people that are passionate about the traditional martial arts. And that includes this show, which we bring you twice a week. Every Monday, we bring you an interview like today. Every Thursday, we bring you some other show, something focused on maybe a subject or a particular aspect of history. And you can find all of our shows at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you want to find all of our projects, you can go to whistlekick.com and you'll see links to everything we've got going on, including our products. We make a ton of stuff. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you can save 15% off everything. Now, today's guest first reached out to me, oh, it was quite a while ago, as an avid listener to the show and, dare I say, even a fan, which is an uncomfortable word for me to use. But we had a great conversation going over email, and he expressed a interesting, maybe not unique, but certainly uncommon personal story. And I said, you know what? You've got that black belt test coming soon. I have every faith you're going to pass it, and when you do, Let's talk about bringing you on the show. Well, that's what's happened, and that's why we have him on today's episode. So, let's welcome him to the show. Mr. Philpot, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Great to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. I've been looking forward to this. We've been, we've been emailing for a little while. We knew that this was coming. Yes, we have. <laughs> and I've been, I've been looking forward to it. I, uh yeah, so so now, I mean, you've you've crossed that threshold, which I know we're going to get into later. And listeners are going, "What what is he talking about? What's he talking about? <laughs> What's he oh, talking no. about?" Well, well, listeners, a um, little bit of trivia. You know, we don't we don't have people on the show who aren't either equivalent to or you know black belt rank. And so, if if I've got my history right, we started talking a little while ago that you were approaching this. Yeah. I was a uh, red belt, I think, whenever we started talking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're, you know, I, I won't spoil it. I'll let, I'll let you, you do the <laughs> reveal when it seems to come up organically. But there was something uh, a little bit different about you and your training and, and what you experience in your day to day life that most of us are unfamiliar with. And, and I think it's going to make for, for some good conversation, for some good story. Well, it might. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's uh, let's start. You know how we start. Let's start that kind of kind of boring but so important foundational way. How did you first find martial arts? I found martial arts by the movies. Um, it it wasn't one necessarily, but the one movie that I really got into was blood sport mm. <laughs> it's a classic. And, and yeah and jean-claude van damme he just opened my eyes to uh, a new world but um due to issues that we'll bring up later um My mom, as a kid, wouldn't allow me to partake in martial arts. And um, due to that fact, I wasn't introduced to uh, Taekwondo, which is what I practice now, um, till about three years ago. And I am 46 now. So. Yeah, I was about 43 whenever me and my girlfriend, fiance, wife, <laughs> uh, w walked into McCain Mall and somebody uh, walked up to me and said, hey, sir, have you ever thought about Taekwondo? I said, yes, I've thought about Taekwondo quite a bit. 
and they said, well, why don't you come try out three classes, see if you like it, and let's go from there. And that's where it started for me. And now I am a first degree black belt and studying to be an instructor. Wow, that's awesome. So I want to go. I want to go back. I want to go back because okay, you, know, you said blood sport, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so blood sport, blood sport. You know, pretty pretty impactful movie for a lot of people who are you know of of roughly your age. You know, maybe even down a little bit to to my age. You got a couple years on me, not much, but what was it about that movie? It was the contact and everything into it, the emotions that got to me, uh, whether it be whenever he's in that big fight scene at the end or when, um, when everything just revolved around, you know, um, martial arts with him, it seemed like, and it, it just, it just grabbed me. What were you into as a kid? If it wasn't martial arts, if, if your mother wasn't cool with the idea of you training what were you doing i was doing choir band and track okay what were your events and track i'm curious uh my events and track were i was a distance runner okay. um and i was a field expert um whether it be shot put long jump um things like that. It was just something to keep me active. Mm -hmm. I think more than anything, because I wasn't the best. I, I wasn't, you know, the fastest, the, the strongest throwing, whatever, you know, I'd, I'd reach fourth place in a field event. And I thought that was good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know but, that it's come up on the show, but I ran track in high school a little bit and I was terrible. But so few people ran hurdles that I was one of the top point getters on the team. Oh, okay. <laughs> Despite being last almost every meet, but last out of five, still got your points. I was along the same lines as you uh, in, in high school. But if I would have had this, um, I I think things would have gone a little bit better for me. How do you how do you think life would have been different if you'd had martial arts as a child? I wouldn't have been as bullied as mm. much. Let me go back just a little bit sure. to tell to tell your listeners a little bit about me. Yeah. Um I was born in 1972. I had 10 fingers, 10 toes, you know. Uh, just like everybody, um, I was the, the fastest reader in first grade. They even put a reading group, just me, um, reading because nobody could keep up with me. Um, and I had reached a third grade reading level by the first grade. If if that tells you anything. Mm -hmm. And then on March 2nd, 1979, I was run over by a delivery truck. I won't say the name on here, but you can imagine back in those days, there was only one or two. But um, I had 22 skull fractures, a split palate, and the doctor said I'd never walk, talk, or see again. When I was I was in a coma for over six weeks, and I had multiple multiple surgeries. And so, my mom, being my mom, she was going to stay by my side for you know the the entire. Um, deal 
and she did. And I had a lot of other family support too. But on Easter Sunday, she left this tape with this nurse of my favorite music. And she, you know, she found out that when she was gone, I would grab tubes and pull them. And, you know, I, I needed my mom's voice or something soothing to help me along. So she found out that playing this music helped. And so she started up the music and went to church to go pray. She came back and they said, Miss Philpot, um, it's about your son. She didn't wait to find out what about me. So she opens up the door in the ICU. And there I am sitting up, tapping my leg, keeping time to kiss. And I had a long struggle besides that. But that was the number one reason why mom wouldn't let me get into physical let's say, uh, where you could hit your head. She didn't let me wrestle, you know, nothing like that. So she wasn't being a mean mom. She was being a, a concerned mom. Mm, protective. Yes. Yes. Very. And after I got out of the hospital, I gained a little bit of sight. Uh, I can see 10 over 300 partial vision in my left eye, which means what you see at 300 feet as a quote-unquote normal person, <laughs> I see it 10 feet, but it's in a tunnel. And I ended up going to the blind school, and uh, I graduated there in 92, and Went on to college, uh, went to UCA, uh, which is the University of Central Arkansas. And I graduated there in 97 with a fine arts and communications degree and a special ed minor. And that's, that's basically the backstory. So obviously, and if anyone has ever experienced any kind of limited vision, you know, I, I'm not even going to pretend to understand what it's like to have 10 over 300. Uh, I started wearing bifocals at age eight. So my yeah. eyes were, to most people, considered terrible. You know? <laughs> so I can imagine a little bit of the spectrum you know, that, that we might be on in terms of ability to not see as well as others. And I know how much that impacted just my life in general, just the little things that would go on, you know, the, the, the ways that I couldn't relate to the world, you know, just to, to go in the water for me yeah. and not be able to see, you know, cause I didn't swim with glasses. We couldn't afford, you know, fancy prescription goggles, you know, so that was pretty different you know so I, I i'm able to to have i i guess a little bit of empathy for what it might be like but i'm not going to pretend that i understand that, so I, that, oh, please go I, ahead I, no that's fine i mean i any perspective that you have me being me i mean i i i joke about a lot of what happened to me um but you know i i used to say when i was growing up um i was run over by a delivery truck scraped up by a fork and a knife and put back together with elmer's glue because <laughs> basically that's what they had to do i'm curious because you know here you are you're pretty young 
you know, and clearly you were talking about your mother needing to leave you with a tape to keep you calm at that age, something that traumatic, it's scary. It's, it's unsettling, but you're making jokes about it now. So at some point you did a complete 180 there. You went from at age six to 46 and somewhere in between you've made peace with this. Do you remember when that was? Uh, I actually do. Um, when I was in college, you know, growing up with sighted friends, um, you know, was hard because, you know, they, they got the cars and everything like that. Well, I tried to be as normal as possible. And me and my girlfriend at the time, she ended up giving me one of her bicycles. Okay, what's what's a visually impaired person doing dri- riding a bike? I know, but <laughs> um, you know, she she wanted me to be as normal as possible. So I'd ride back and forth from the apartment to class and I'd leave the bike out on you know the sidewalk where I'd know where it was and I wasn't walking around with my cane at all and this is um it was kind of like it is today kind of rainy kind of spotty um but I was going to ride the bike and I decided to ride the bike on the side of the sidewalk so that nobody could accidentally hit me with a car. So I ended up going off the sidewalk into the grass. And so I had to stand up because the grass is a little wet and get more momentum going and wham Mm. i knocked myself out um i ended up hitting an army reserve post sign that was there on the side of the road and i must have stayed there for like 30 minutes maybe just trying to get my bearings back and i think right after that i'm like i know as normal as i am i'm not that normal so i might might want to give other people signals that if i bump into you there's a reason for it. And so after that, I started walking with a cane. You know, I have enough vision to get around, possibly. Sometimes, some days it's worse than others. But I'll always have my cane, even though I walk 90 to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> because of my track experience sure. back in you know i mean you run distance you know you'll always have that fast walk yeah and so that that really opened up my eyes um so to speak um you know um it's all it's all good i mean i I've said time and time again that I would like to meet the gentleman that ran over me um, so I could shake his hand and tell him everything's okay. Mm. I'm okay with everything. I wouldn't be the man I am today had it not been for what happened back in 1979. I think it's easy when 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 we when we talk about a situation like this when we talk about whatever the 
the difficulty, whatever the pain is that we go through. It's easy to say, oh, I, I wouldn't be who I am today. But I get the sense that you've spent a lot of time contemplating that, that you're able to truly mean those words when you say that, and that you're proud of who you are. Yes, very much so. How I, I think it's obvious how not having your sight has negatively impacted your life. <laughs> but let's flip that. How how has it benefited you? Why and how has it made you the person you are in such a way that you're proud of who you are? My mom taught me independence at an early age. I mean, she she told me that she she wasn't going to be here forever. You know, that I was going to have to do some stuff on my own. And that combined with the teachers at the Arkansas School for the Blind and the mentors that I had later in life, um, I ended up, my mom and dad got divorced when I was two. And when I turned 10, mom decided that I needed some more guidance. And so she hooked me up with a uh, big brother. You know, the Big Brother, Little Brother Association? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was that's what she hooked me up with. And I met this young man. Uh, he was, he had a family. He had Christian values. And it, he helped me in that aspect of, you know, things could be worse. <laughs> um, he, um, whenever he brought me home for the first time, he had taken me out to McDonald's and stuff. Um, mom ended up saying, well, Brent, did you have fun? And I said, yeah, mom. And, and he's got all kinds of gadgets inside his car, like the Batmobile. And she's like, okay. And, and Paul said, my big brother, he said, um, yeah, Brent, but what I didn't show you was the ejector seat. <laughs> <laughs> But going back to what you asked, I mean, I guess it's always been, you know, in my psyche or whatever that, you know, things could be worse. I mean, I, I could be still in a coma, um, waiting on mom or, you know, or, People waiting on me hand and foot. I I never wanted that. So let's talk about your training. Let's okay. talk about what it's like to do martial arts as someone who misses out on what I think most of us rely on, which is imitation. Yes. The way I've learned darn near everything in my martial arts career has been watching what the instructor has been doing and then to do it myself. How do you learn? Muscle memory, for the most part, um, just, like, just like you. But mine, my muscle memory has to be um, like, you know, the instructors all have, um, what's that called? Um, personal touch. Um, uh, you know, they know, uh, to, you know, to touch your shoulder, to touch, you know, um, not touch you inappropriately, right? but they, they form 
my hands and my arms the way that they need to be until I'm to that point. And they say, hold that. And that's a um, double forearm block. Or that's a low block. And if I do it over and over and over again, doing the same thing, I learn it. Um, with my head injuries, it's a little difficult sometimes to keep it inside my head. But, um, you know, that's what the instructors are for. Um, I, I, love my instructors um ata black belt academy is where i go in north little rock and they are phenomenal with the way the way that they have learned to uh teach a visually impaired person and i don't know if you know gk Lee, no. He, he's the soon to be the Grand Master of ATA. Uh, at Worlds, he will be. Okay. And, um, his wife owns the school that I go to. Um, her name is Kathy Lee. Chief Master Kathy Lee. And she took me aside one day after a tournament. I'm trying to remember. We we went to Germantown, Tennessee. And um she took me aside and she said Brent, I want to let you know that I'm having a conversation with the blind and the deaf school because of you. And I said, ma'am, what about? And she said that she she's talking to them about doing some classes there at the school. And she was wondering if I'd be interested in uh, instructing. And I, at the time, my life has been all over the place. Um, I have sang, you know, with choir and everything. I, I have a decent voice. Um, you can find me on iTunes. <laughs> uh, with four of the original songs that I wrote and one cover. Um, you can find me on Amazon. Um, Stories from Grandpa, my book. But I'd never thought about instructing. You know, I'd always thought about learning. And that's that's where my place was. And then during um, during the Christmas holiday, I just put two and two together. And I said, well, if I'm going to instruct, I need to instruct. So all these side projects that, that I was doing at the time, like, trying to form a band, um, whatever, writing books. I just put them aside. Uh, I, I've gone full-fledged into Taekwondo now. And when I'm not working, I'm at the, at the dojang. And, you know, uh, that and family, uh, I'm currently married and my wife is 
so good. She was the one that actually said, hey, you know, why don't you try out Taekwondo and things like that. So how how has Taekwondo changed your life? I mean, you said it's been a few years now. So you've you've certainly spent enough time doing it that you've become passionate about it. You've dedicated a lot of time to it. You're just talking about how important it is to you and how important you're expecting it to remain, at least in the near future. But there has to be a reason why. There has to have been some impact for you. So what what is that impact? You know, that's a hard question. People ask me before I receive my black belt, why do you want to become a black belt? I said, and I still believe this to this day, to inspire others. And that's, that's my goal in life, pretty much. When you come from um, Oma to where I am now, I mean, like, my right side was partially paralyzed in the accident. Um, my fine motor skills on my right side are not like they are on my left. But now with martial arts, they're getting better. Um, and that's what I want to do in being an instructor and being in Taekwondo is to inspire somebody to do something. It doesn't have to be martial arts, you know, to have them go outside of their four walls, if that makes any sense. It does. What was it like for you starting Taekwondo? <laughs> we, we, hear, we hear from everyone, and, and, and I remember, and, and I've talked to so many people, that first time, that first class, it's so intimidating, it's so scary. Now, I'm going to imagine that you or your wife had a conversation with the instructor ahead of time and said, hey, I don't see so well. You know, so, <laughs> um, you know, so what, what was that first class like? That first class was a learning experience for all of us. Um, my wife and I started Taekwondo together. So I had a buddy with me. Um, until she got to the yellow belt and they started doing kicks and she remembered very heavily that she had a slip disc in her back and her chiropractor told her never again <laughs> will you do this but the first class i was a mess um I mean, I had no balance. I had no no guidance on what to do or how to do it. But I knew that I was going to, I knew I was going to finish the class. And that was most important. Why? And then it just went from there. I mean, I ended up I ended up going to the office right after that first class and signed a contract. You were hooked after one class. Yeah. After what, one class. It? it didn't what, what it didn't it? take the it didn't take the three classes that they said. And we hear that a lot from people that there's something for them when they when they find martial arts, it's almost like it's it was fate for them to find it. So what what was it after one class that you knew this was something you wanted to put a, a, a lot of time and, and money into? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I, and that's the honest truth. I don't know. But I knew that that I it was calling to me. 
Uh, I knew my grandfather on my mom's side was a teacher slash principal. And I had gone to college with that in mind to become a teacher. That's the reason for the special ed mm. minor. Sure. Um, the reason that I didn't follow through on that is because I took PPST three times and missed it by one point each time in math. And they don't let you, you know, go further into education unless you pass that test. So I said, well, that's not for me, but something will be. Uh, after I got out of college, I taught um, disabled adults um, drama, and I did that for six years. Um, but then that fell through. Uh, I moved to New Orleans. A week later, Katrina happened. And all my stuff got taken away by Katrina. Um, but I still wouldn't. I, I, I'm like, you know, something. Something still keeps me going. And. After that first class of Taekwondo, it was like, this is home. And whether it makes sense to your listeners or not, you know, it, it makes sense to me. And later on, you know, after three years of learning, I want to bestow upon people what I know. And uh, I guess it's that teacher mentality that in me, you know, from my grandfather, um, that keeps me going. And also, he was a Golden Gloves boxer, too. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that might have something to do with it as well, and not giving up. Yeah. Well, let, let's switch gears. Let's, you know, we've talked, we've talked about you. We've talked about what this has been like from your side, but let's, let's talk a little bit about what it's been like for the others. You mentioned that in your first class, it was a learning experience for everyone. I would assume that included other students and the people that were teaching. So what has it been like for the people that have taught you? How have they reacted? What have they told you? about what it's been like to teach you? They, they've told me that it's an experience. I don't really ask them, you know, what it's like to teach me. Um, when my, my, um, my instructor right now, my master right now is a sixth degree black belt. He's, Going to the seventh degree this summer, I started off with the black belt form, what I knew of it, which was the first, what, three moves. And he helped me to continue to the 33rd move in black belt form. And he, al he always pats me on the shoulder and says, you are awesome. No matter what you think about what you're doing, you're awesome. And I can imagine what he brings home to, you know, whoever he goes home to, um, his wife or whatever, um, you know, and what he might be saying to them. But every, every experience for me, Every day is a new day. And, you know, I wake up in the morning and I say, at least I'm awake and I'm heading to work. 
So I wake up five o'clock in the morning, let out my three dogs, and go to work. Then I come back home and then I, you know, do whatever I'm going to do. Um, and normally it's around Taekwondo or my family. <laughs> I'm sorry if that wasn't the answer that you were looking for, but I'm, I'm never looking for a particular answer. I think I think you know that. I yeah. We just follow it where it goes, and and this is this is why I bring on people from everywhere and different styles and different experiences because so we can we can look at this from two very different, very distinct ways. We can look at this from the perspective of your learning, your training is very different from most people's because their learning is very different. Or we can look at this from the perspective of you're passionate about your training and you're investing your time to make yourself, your new martial arts, better, which is the common experience that we all have. Yeah. And that's how I choose to look at it. Yeah. I, you know, when, when I bring people on, we talk about the differences, we talk about the things that are, are unique to them but I do that as much because I get feedback from people who listen, who say, I identified with that person. And then in identifying with that person, the reality of how much we all have in common seems to be that much more approachable to them. And that's why I like to balance out the show in that way. Yeah. Have you competed? Yes. I, I, know, I know the ATA has quite a few competitions. I, I don't know if I would go so far as to say the ATA is big on competing, but we've had a number of ATA practitioners on the show, and they've all, I, I believe they've all, spoken about a substantial amount of competition. So what's that experience been like for you? It's been tremendous. Um I am in what they call special abilities classification, physical abilities, uh, physical, well, physical handicap. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not much PC. Hey, you know what? This is your episode. And if, <laughs> how do I put this? If you want to call it handicap, you're welcome to. I don't feel like I have the credibility to decide what term is appropriate, but I don't think anyone gets to to say that you're using the wrong word to describe yeah. you and your experience. And if yeah. anybody that does, they can talk to me about it, and uh, I'll just ban them from the show. Yeah. Well, um, I uh, I've done um, a bunch of tournaments like um germantown uh things like that and we also have regionals which is state um competitions where we take like three or four states and put them all together and you know see who see who wins in that aspect mm -hmm. and now i am going to worlds for the first time cool. and i'm going to worlds within the top 10 of my category in weapons sparring combat and um forms and looking at the looking at that on the ata side it was like oh my gosh i'm i'm really really doing this you know <laughs> it, it it didn't dawn on me that I was, you know, competing slash, you know, in the 
public eye, so to speak, um, until just uh, just about a week ago, whenever all the um, regionals finished, and you know everybody had their scores in and everything, and me and my wife looked on my on my site or the site and it said Brent you're you're within the top 10 so I'm going to go to worlds as a top 10 competitor and to worlds start out the tournament so there's going to be two competitions that weekend are you looking forward to that oh more than you know why tell 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 me about that <sighs> what does competing mean to you competing you me, competing means to me that i'm doing it um uh, you know it's like you and jumping hurdles okay my aspect of jumping hurdles is taking one step closer to where my masters are or were in my in my time of life or whatever um three years into the into taekwondo I'm actually, you know, not becoming something because I've already been something, but I'm actually making a stamp on on the fact that I'm as I said, I'm doing this. What are you doing to prepare? Going over my forms again and again. Um even when I'm not in the Dojang, uh, I have a carport that is, um, I treat it like my mat at the Dojang. And um, I do my weapon, which is uh, the, the Zhang, what is it? Oh, it's the staff. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I can't think of the word right now, but, um, and the reason that that, um, is my weapon of choice is because of, I've used a cane all my life or just about, and, you know, it, it, feels good in my hand. It feels at home. I don't think I've ever dropped it. Maybe once. Whenever I was doing a uh, a finger roll. But, you know, your home is your home. And uh, I found my home in Taekwondo and uh, the dojang that I'm studying at. Let's talk about more future stuff. What are what are your goals? You've you've alluded to kind of a general desire to improve and and progress towards where your instructors have been or are. But do you have anything more concrete than that? Not really. I mean, I if. I have my way when when the time is right. I want to open up my dojang and have it open to not only um, physically abled people, but the disabled. Um, I don't want there to be any barriers and so far there hasn't been for me 
I mean, there's been a few hiccups, but so far there hasn't been for me. Now, of course, I imagine that you spend a decent amount of time online. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's unfair to make that assumption. Uh, I had a, I had a friend in college. Here's why I say this: I had a friend in college who I worked with in the IT department. And he was, he was pretty darn blind. I mean, he could he could see a little bit. He could make out where there were streetlights, you know, yes. by, by by the light, and that's all he had. And the only reason I know that is that one one day I was walking him back to his dorm, and he made a hard left to stay on the path. I said, "Wait a second, have you been lying to me this whole time?" He said, "No, <laughs> I I can." I can see from the light, you know, just a, a little bit of the shadow as to, you know, and, and just have it. I know where this path is. I said, oh, okay. yes. But he was able to spend a fair amount of time online because it was a very democratizing platform. Anything that was out there would, you know, he, he had screen reader software that could tell him what he was looking at. And as an aside, folks, this is why if you make a website and you've got the little box or the alt text, Yes, there's an SEO benefit to putting that in there, but this is why you put something in that box. Yes. Because when someone cannot see the photo, whatever is in that box is what will be read to the person who is using screen reader software. Yes, exactly. So that's a very long-winded question. Do you spend a decent amount of time online? Uh, all the time. Okay. <laughs> All the time. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I listen to podcasts constantly. If people want to find you, you know, you, you mentioned social media, you know, give, give us give us those handles. How do people find you? Brent underline Philpot is my handle on Twitter. And Brent Philpot is my um my name on Facebook. Uh, I don't don't go by anything else. Um, and um, I have a YouTube uh, channel as well that's called Brent Philpot. And in that YouTube channel, it's a sub channel called the Eye Opener. Mm. And what would we find in there? Different, different things. Uh, me, me doing uh, some taekwondo stuff. Me uh, doing crazy things like um, me doing a zip line across a river. Uh, <laughs> I'm a nut. Um, <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I've I've even skydove from ten thousand feet. That was a trip and a half. But um, yeah, you can find me just about anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure that it's Brent Philpot from North Little Rock, Arkansas, and I'll friends you or uh let you follow me on twitter and of course folks you know we do post all of these links in the show notes whistlekick martial arts radio.com so you know no no need to, to jot them down now if you're and if your memory is is poor you can you can head on over we'll make sure we have all that stuff in it and links to other things that we've talked about today well good Good. So as we as we wrap up, as we wind down, you know what I'm about to ask you. You've heard yes. me ask so many people this before. So I've got a feeling you've been thinking about this one. So what parting advice would you give to the listeners today? Don't judge others. What I mean by that. Don't put people in a box. Like subcategories. You know, it. It always it always makes me kind of smile, you know, whenever somebody sees me out in public and they they say, you know, you're you're normal. <laughs> uh, I, I have to laugh because yeah, I am. But if you knew how hard it was to get this way, 
Um, so I was going to say one thing, though, and I guess I can leave your listeners with this. Fear is just an acronym, meaning false evidence appearing real. And that's the way I've lived my life. There are many things that I love about the martial arts, but today's episode, today's guest, makes me think strongly about two of them. The first is that the martial arts is a, is a place for everyone. Everyone belongs in this thing that we all do. And then the second thing, the thing that I don't think about very often, but I'm glad that I'm reminded of, is that everyone has something to contribute to the martial arts. Our unique path through life, our upbringing, the things that make us who we are as individuals, when we get to contribute that back to the martial arts, whether that be through a school of our own or even as a student, we're all better because of that. And I don't know that we've ever had a guest that made me think about that so much as today's guest. So thank you, sir, for coming on the show. You can find show notes with a whole bunch of stuff, links and photos and tons of stuff over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there, sign up for the newsletter. We've been sending out more and more, and we've got some unique original content coming through in those newsletters. If you haven't seen it, well, you should. Check it out. And don't forget the code PODCAST15. That's going to get you 15% off everything at whistlekick.com. If you want to help us out, whether that's through making a purchase or leaving a review on Apple's podcast store or another one, or maybe share this episode or something else that we've got going on with a friend. Help us grow. Help us reach more people. Help us expand the martial arts. And if you want to find us on social media, we've got some fun and funny stuff going on there. We are at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, YouTube. We're all over the place. And if you want to get to me directly, the best way, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>